Well, good morning, everyone. As we begin this morning, we're going to start with reading some scripture, and then the choir is going to sing. Um, I love this passage, the Emmaus Road passage that Josh is going to preach today. Those two guys, just what was going through their head as they had just experienced that, the three days in the tomb, and then to hear that he was alive, uh, we just don't know. We're going to dive into that text together. But sometimes... Uh, God may not make sense. And this song is from Psalm 13, where the psalmist, well, you'll hear in a second what he says and how we can still trust the Lord even when we don't understand. So the scripture says this, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me, agony in my mind every day? How long will my enemy dominate me, consider me and answer me, Lord my God, restore brightness to my eyes, otherwise I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have triumphed over him, and my foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your deliverance. I will sing to the Lord because he has treated me generously. Ah. Uh. 
Good morning. He has been good to us. Amen. Amen. It is so good to see you. We want to welcome you to Second Baptist Church, otherwise known as the Second Fam. We are so glad that you're here, and there's a lot to celebrate. Did you hear that Arkansas baseball won the SEC championship? Yep. Woohoo. Not doing the suey part, but woohoo. Um, and then another exciting thing happening today, it is the, or not today, this week, it's the last week of school. Are any kids and teachers excited? Oh yes, we got some high fives there. And then today is actually Pentecost Sunday, which is just kind of a fancy way to say that we are celebrating the start of the church, right? And what means in that, or what that means, is the beauty of relationship. That years ago, that God birthed this thing called the church that you and I get to be a part of. The beauty of family, the beauty of relationships, all the way down from babies to great-great-grandmas. And so we get to gather today to celebrate so much that God is doing not only here in this church, but around the world globally. So if it's your first time here, or maybe you're watching online, we are so glad that you're here, and we want to connect with you. We want to hear your story. So there is a card in the seat back in front of you, or you can hop online if you're watching online. And we would love to just know your name, your email address, and ways that we can get in touch with you. There's also a spot on there for prayer request. So if there's anything that our leadership and staff could come alongside and encourage you with and pray along with you, we would love to do that. Um, tonight, we have a sold out women's event called the Better Together Dinner. And we are getting to hear from stories of women in the second family of how they have seen God's faithfulness through seasons of suffering. And so I want to personally thank you. I'm so excited for tonight because tonight is the first night that many of our women are coming back for the very first time after COVID. And so as I was seeing registrations come in, my heart just got more and more excited just about us getting to gather together and encourage one another. And so I want to say thank you for faithfully giving. Thank you for sacrificially coming alongside the different ministries of this church so that we can gather around some good barbecue you and encourage one another with the word of God. And so thank you. There are a couple ways you can give. There's boxes in the back. There's a box out by the office, and then you can always hop online, which is probably the easiest. So would you stand with me, and we can pray together as a family, and then we will continue worshiping together. God, we do thank you. Thank you for being good to us in good seasons and in hard seasons. God, we thank you for family. We thank you for the church. We thank you for brothers and sisters that stand in the gap for us when life is hard. We thank you for brothers and sisters that celebrate with us graduations and births. God, we thank you for this family. We thank you for how you are taking the gospel to Conway, to Arkansas, and to the ends of the earth. What an incredible journey to be on with you. And so God, I pray as we worship together that you would be honored that you would be glorified, and that every single person in this room and watching online, God, that they would know that you are a good, good Father, and that you are walking with us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to continue standing and sing with us in worship as we, as we give praise and honor to our God, our Father, the one who does great things in us and through us, and will continue to do those things. Give him the praise of the Lord. Let's worship together. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at his feet as he has done great things. And see what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes because he has done great things. has done great things. Oh, here of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom. Awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. Yeah. 
everything that we are dealing with, God. That our lives are open to you, our hearts are open to you to speak into us this morning. We're creation, suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. And from the
Well, good morning. How are you today? Good. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 24. That's where we're going to be today. And welcome to all of those of you who are watching online, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, uh, however it is that you are watching or listening. We're so glad that you are here um, with us both virtually and in person. It's a good day uh, to worship with the second family. If you are new with us, my name is Josh King. I'm lead pastor here, and, and uh, it really does mean a lot to us that you are worshiping with us this morning. A little over a week ago, my uh, sons decided that they needed some new sporting equipment. And uh, so we took off for the sporting goods store, Dick's Sporting Goods store, and, and they, needed, uh, they needed some, um, you know, one of them needed a basketball one of them needed a soccer ball, and one of them needed a volleyball. This is very specific what we were doing. So I went and bought $70 worth of air um, that was wrapped in these three balls, you know. And, and uh, because of the traffic up on the highway, the bridge they're working on there, you know, uh, it routed us through downtown. So we're, we're at the Hark Rider Oak intersection, right? And there's this truck next to us that is pulling a horse trailer, a, a big old horse trailer. And you could see the horse's nose through this little mesh screen there. And uh, Leland decides he wants to talk to this horse. And uh, the weather was good, so we rolled the window down, all of our windows down. And Leland starts, you know, going on with this horse. But a horse is a horse, of course, of course. So the horse didn't speak back to us. Um, And uh, Leland, you know, neighed at it, tried to pet it. I'm telling you, the, the horse was maybe a foot from Leland's face right there. And if it, were, if it weren't for that screen mesh, he could have he grabbed it. Uh, so we go back to nothing. We're just sitting there with the windows down and everything. And that horse lets out a neigh, and it is the loudest noise I have ever heard in my life. I've heard horses neigh before, but never have I heard one scream like it's an atomic bomb going off. And I turned to see kind of what this thing was that was making this noise, you know, just in time to see my oldest and my middle child look like they are about to come through the roof or mess their pants or something along those lines. And as a dad, that thoroughly entertained me, you know. I sat there laughing as hard as I could for the rest of that life till my stomach was hurting. And that story is, um, has really nothing to do with anything. I I just thought it was a funny story and I wanted to share it with you because stories sometimes are that way. Sometimes when you hear a story, uh, when somebody tells you a story, when you read a story, it's just kind of what happened. It's the events that took place. Sometimes they have greater and deeper meanings, but oftentimes they are just what happens. And and sometimes when we read the Bible stories, there's a lot of stories that we're going to come across that, that it's just the narrative. It's what happened next in the story. Oftentimes I think that when you hear a story, it's one of those stories where I guess you had to be there. There's other times where you hear a story where you wish you were there. You know, it's just this range of stories that come at you. Today in Luke, Luke is wrapping up this story about Jesus. And he tells a story that seems at first glance just to be about nothing. It's just what happened, right? When we read it, it's kind of what happened. But I think upon further study, we really see that there's something much deeper happening in that story, that it's not just a story that there's some meaning and some impact for our lives. So if you would, would you pray with me? Pray for my voice, for my nose, because Arkansas is mad at my face right now. So pray for that, and, and I will pray for you, okay? Let's do that. God, thank you for this morning, and thank you for what you have blessed us with, this church that we get to worship alongside. God, this story that we get to read and, and apply to our lives. God, I pray that as we do look at the text, that where we do not measure up, where we have fallen behind, where we do not see you as you are, where we do not fellowship one with another and those who need you, God, I pray that we would leave here today committed to seeing you in the everyday mundane errands that we run, seeing you as the scriptures come to life in our own lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Luke 24, 13 is where we're going to be. It's a story about two friends walking and talking, as friends will do. They're just walking and hanging out. They are talking about the night trial. They're talking about what just took place in Jerusalem, this, this uh, very dramatic weekend. They're discussing those things. In fact, one of them says to Jesus later on, 
that he would have to be living under a rock not to be aware of or at least hear something about the case of Jesus v. Sanhedrin. It's a big deal that's going on and it's a big dominant theme that's happening here. So let's take a look and read the text. It's a little bit longer than what I normally would read to you, but I want you to grab your Bibles and Colin, follow along. Read it as I read it. Verse 13, Now that same day two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. I wanted to show you kind of where that is. This is Israel. Mediterranean seas over here. Arkansas is way over that way. China is way over that way. And here in Jerusalem, Jesus began his life up here, and a lot of his ministry happened around there. But here in Jerusalem is where the night trial takes place, his crucifixion takes place. And it's Emmaus, it's about seven miles to the northwest of Jerusalem there. You'll also notice on the map that Emmaus and Bethphage are in uh, those little circles. They're not completely filled in, and that just signifies that we don't exactly know where it was, but best scholarship would say that it was somewhere up in that region, about seven miles away. And together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, pause right there, it's really debated on who the other person is. We're going to find out that one of them is named Cleopas, which is the male version of the name Cleopatra. Cleopas is walking, and then there is another person. It says now the same day there were two of them. And so scholars have debated on, was that a friend? Was it another disciple? Was it possibly Cleopas' wife? In fact, this week somebody called me and asked me, do I believe that Cleopas is walking with his wife? And I said, yes. I said, how can you be so sure? And I said, because they were arguing. It says right there. <laughs> also, I think that that's a good hint to start to think that that's maybe that way, but also a little later on in the evening when Jesus and these are walking, they just go ahead, Cleopas just go ahead and says he can stay for dinner, and he didn't even ask anybody. So I know that the other person was his wife because Cleopas knew he could have Jesus over. That's pretty good. That's solid scholarship right there. Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them, but they were prevented from recognizing him. And then he asked them, what is this dispute that you are having with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. And the one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? What things, Jesus? He plays uh, dumb, like he doesn't know what's going on. He says, what things? And so they said to him the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Now, look at the way that they describe him. They say, who was a prophet, powerful in action and in speech, word and deed, you might say, before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. That's important as well, because we all know that the Romans are the ones that killed him. But the general consensus at the time, the perception was, that the religious leaders of the Jews were the ones at fault for that. But, verse 21, but we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all of this, it's the third day since these things happened. And moreover, some of the women, and he'll go on 22 down to 24, describing how some of the women went. Uh, Jesus wasn't there. They, Jesus told them that he wasn't there. And then some others went to confirm that. Verse 25, and he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets had spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter his glory? Glory, And then beginning in Moses and the prophets, that's the Old Testament. That's just a way of saying it. That's an ock. He interpreted for them the things concerning himself and all of Scripture. And they came near the village where they were going, and he gave them the impression that he was going further. So not only is he playing like he doesn't know what's going on, it's like, ah, I just got, I got to go see a guy about a horse. So they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening. And now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And this is really interesting. Picture this. This has been a long walk, seven miles. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But he disappeared right from their sight they said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while we were talking with him on the road? And he was explaining the scriptures to us. In that very hour, they got up, returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven. 
And those who were gathered together, and they go on to tell the story. They even hear a little bit about a similar story that happened to Peter. It's a normal story. Everything happening in the text is something that has happened to you before. Most of the things. There's a few things there that are, are, are kind of unusual or spiritual, but the story as you read it is just a normal, everyday sort of story. I wrote down some of the things that are happening in here. Some of these things you did this week, some of these things you'll do today. They were walking. They're walking with a friend, discussing the news, arguing about what it means. They were interrupted by a stranger. You ever been interrupted by a stranger? They were. They were called fools by somebody they do not know. Has that ever happened to you? Happens to me sometimes. They are not recognizing what is in front of them. There was shock and hopelessness. One guy in the group is doing all of the talking. Uh, they invited a friend to dinner, a new friend to dinner. There's eating, lounging around, and then all of a sudden recognizing where you know that one guy from. And being excited about something you just learned, rushing off to tell your other friends. It's a normal story. It, it could happen to any of us. What I'm saying is these two individuals weren't doing extraordinary spiritual churchy things when Jesus interrupts their life. They were just walking home. Just walking home after this exciting, eventful afternoon or weekend in Jerusalem. All of this stuff has happened to you before. It probably will happen very soon. But even from the mundane, we can learn a bit more. We can see something else. Like this whole business about hopelessness. You can see it in 17 and 21. It says in Luke 24, 17, it says, They stopped walking and looked discouraged, downtrodden, beat up. That might be a way to say it. And in verse 21, they allude to this, saying that they were hoping. In other words, they were now hopeless because of what they were hoping for not really coming to be. They are discouraged. They are hopeless. These two friends had a common view that a lot of people had about the Messiah at that time. They expected the Messiah, the Messiah, to come and to rid them of the Roman influence in their lives. They wanted somebody to come and overthrow the Roman government to reestablish the throne of David, to kick out the bad guys and to uh, re-enthrone the good guys. They wanted to be free and self-governing and powerful, not just free, but also dominant. They wanted their enemies subjected to them. That's what they hoped for. That's what they thought the Messiah would give to them. But that's not what the Messiah gave to them. And this isn't new to Luke at the end. In fact, in Luke chapter 2, you remember that story about Simeon? He's, a, he's an old dude that's at the uh, temple, and Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to him. He holds Jesus, and he says, I can now go in peace. Your servant can now go in peace. Why? Because I have seen the salvation, the redemption, the ransom of Israel. That's what he says. A little later on, Jesus is talking to his disciples and says, that he has come to give himself a ransom for many. This is a theme all the way through Luke, this whole idea of being redeemed or ransomed, that the Messiah would free the people. That's the concept. And so they were expecting something along those lines. They were expecting what many of us still expect. They were doing what many of us still do. They were seeing Jesus in terms of politics and not religion. They were seeing him in terms of earthly power, and they hoped that Jesus would give them that, that Jesus would reestablish their earthly power, their influence over culture and the way things are. They were also sadly laboring under the idea that Jesus cared about their political power and the power of his followers. That's not what Jesus came to do, and it disappointed them. They misunderstood Scripture because of that. They misunderstood what, the, uh, what Moses and the prophets were saying because they were looking at Jesus through a lens. Through the lens that was given to them, they were looking at it and they became disenchanted. I think a lot of people become disenchanted with religion because they're approaching religion in a way that it would do something for them instead of something that they are a part of, a family, instead of some ladder to climb. On Friday night, we... Uh, decided to make uh, chocolate chip cookies. We we're going to make some chocolate chip cookies at our house. And I was excited because we had everything. Does that ever happen to you? You like decide you're going to make cookies, you're halfway through it, and you don't have, I don't know, chocolate chips or something, you know, very important. But we had it all. And so I was making the chocolate chip cookies, and I put in too much baking soda. 
Uh, it's a teaspoon, not a tablespoon. And so I put that in there, but I caught it. So before it got stirred up, I scooped out most of it into this empty uh, measuring cup that was sitting over there. And then a little while later, I needed the measuring cup, and I picked it up, and I looked in there, and I thought, oh, this is some extra flour. And so I dumped it back into the cookies. But I caught it again, and I pulled out my now two times putting too much baking soda in our cookies. But I thought, this is not going to be good. These are ruined. So we cooked the first batch, and uh, they're not looking exactly right. They're, you know, you got to watch the cookies. You can't just leave them in there. You got to watch the cookies, you know. And I'm watching these cookies um, for the nine minutes as they bake, and I'm watching this, and I'm thinking, they're not looking right. These aren't going to taste good. So we pull them out, and um, they're sitting there, and they looked okay. And I decided I'm going to have one, you know, of course. And, um, and we don't have any milk. We didn't have any milk. And so, I mean, like total disappointment. And you can't have new, um, warm chocolate chip cookies without milk. And so I was just really, dis- I took a little bite. I was just really discouraged. I was disappointed because it didn't taste right. It didn't have any milk. I was, I was done with it. I only ate three. I was so upset with it. And then only one the next day. You know, it's just, it's just too much for me because of my expectations on those cookies made me a little bit discouraged. You know, I had another one the next day and another one, and I'll probably eat some more today, you know. That's what they did. They had certain expectations on Jesus and what he would provide for them. And when he didn't, when he challenged their views and the views of other people, then uh, they walked away hopeless. They walked away discouraged. That's something we see just in the normal story, the, the way that it goes. But even though this story is very common, there are clearly some spiritual elements. It's as one author said, it is both normal and mysterious at the same time. Now, we need to be careful here, or rather I do. When you read a story like this in the Bible that's reported as historical events, you don't want to, nor do you have the license to make it allegorical, or for a lack of a better word, have a deeper meaning than it really does. Um, when we're reading the Bible, sometimes, like I said, there are stories in there that are just, they're literally stories. I don't mean just stories like they don't have a big impact. I mean, they were given to us to show us the the way the events went. But sometimes people like to read a story and then they'll find all of this deeper meaning all over the text. For example, in this story, Emmaus is how far from Jerusalem? Seven miles. And so somebody might read that and go, ah, I figured it out. I know what that sly Luke is doing there. He wants us to read our Bible every day, seven days a week. And that's why it's seven miles, seven days a week. If you don't read your Bible, Jesus is not walking with you. Now, should you read your Bible every day? Yes. But why did Luke mention that Emmaus was seven miles from Jerusalem? Do you have any idea? Because it was seven miles from Jerusalem. That's all it means. That's all that's there, all right? And so you don't want to go through here and find all of this little spiritual meanings and these magic and this little underlying um, deep truths and things. They're there. But a lot of times when the authors of the Bible write, they just write to tell you what happened. I do see some uh, spiritual themes, some uh, maturing Christian application that we could take from this. The, The first one that I see is found in verse 15. And it's mentioned a couple of times there. It says, And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. When you read back through the text later on, read through the story that we just read there, you'll notice that there is an emphasis on the idea that they were just walking along, living their lives, and Jesus comes alongside and walks with them. All throughout Luke, there is this common drumbeat that Jesus is always on some sort of journey, that he is making his way to Jerusalem, that he is leaving Jericho, that he is on his way to see somebody or on his way to talk to these people. Jesus is always moving. And what it teaches us and what it symbolizes in Luke is this idea that God has a mission and that God is always moving toward the success of his mission for his purposes and his plans. And the beautiful thing is that he invites us to follow him that we can follow along with Jesus as he walks through his plan and his mission. I think it's valuable 
It's valuable that we see that Jesus is a moving God, that he invites us to follow along with him and walk with him, not just running around like duck, duck, goose, like duck, he's got you, and then you can just sit there the rest of your life, but this pursuit, this walking along with Jesus. And Psalms, in fact, Psalms starts by saying, blessed is the man who walks not in the advice of the wicked. Walking. Micah 6, 8 says, that the Lord requires that we walk humbly with him, walking. Over and over and over again in the Bible, and particularly in Luke, there is this theme that Jesus is on a mission. He is walking forward, and he invites you to walk along with him, to follow him. That's not, that's not it. There's another one there as well. In 16 and in 31, it says, but they were prevented from recognizing him. This is clearly one of those mysterious, uh, you know what I'm trying to say, mysterious, mysterious things, spiritual things. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. Sight, seeing, recognized, disappeared. All of this is a spiritual theme that Luke is wanting you to really see here. He wants you to see, or at least ask yourself, can I see the way that Jesus wants me to see? We would maybe use the word understanding. It's the idea that we would see with our eyes, but also with our minds. Most usually when we look back on our life is when we can understand things. Have you ever gone through anything in your life where at the time you think it's, it's bad, it's the worst thing that ever happened to you, but then you look back on it and you realize that that whole time that God was working out his plan, that you see what he was doing. That's what's happening in this text. That's the understanding that's going on. People go down all sorts of wayward paths simply because they don't actually know what the Bible says. If you look in the, uh, in the story here, how Jesus teaches them is by starting back in Moses and the prophets, what we would call the Old Testament, the Tanakh, that he goes back into the Old Testament and he shows them that he's always been up to this, that he would always be the one who suffers, that he was always about writing a new law on their hearts, not in, uh, you know, jurisdiction or whatever, that this was always what Jesus was about. But we get twisted up when we don't know what the Bible says, what it actually says. We sometimes take to the text some understandings or some traditions or some ideas that we've picked up along the way and we make it say what we want it to say. And this happens on two fronts. On one side, we will add to it. We'll, we'll see something, we'll point to it, and we'll say, well, that means, and it may or may not mean that. And we become a legalist. We strip the gospel of grace. On the other side of it, we don't know what the text says, and so we don't obey. We become antinomian. We become liberal. We run off that side. And listen to me, on both sides is death. On both sides is pain. And the only way that will remedy that, the only way that will fix that, is when you actually know what the Bible says. What did Jesus say about that? What did the New Testament teach about that? How are we supposed to understand these things? Now, I don't know what Jesus actually said to Cleopas and his friend. Maybe he quoted uh, Psalm 16, Psalm 110, Psalm 118, several pieces of Isaiah, Daniel 7, and Joel chapter 2. Wouldn't it be good if Luke had written down uh, this Bible study, you know, that Jesus led. If he had written down exactly what Jesus said in that moment, it'd be a bestseller. It'd be, it'd be, it would change our lives. It'd be better than any other Bible study we've ever done because Jesus takes the Old Testament and shows who he is. How do I know that Jesus may have used those passages in Psalm, Daniel, Joel, Isaiah? Because all of those passages are already quoted by Luke in the gospel. He's already quoted all of those passages to show you exactly what Jesus was doing. So it makes sense that maybe that's exactly what Jesus did. So in this everyday common story, we see this theme of walking with Jesus. We see this theme of seeing Jesus for who he is. And then there's another one. This one may really kind of hit you where you enjoy. It says, Luke 24, verse 30, it was as he was reclining at the table with them, 
that he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. There's another spiritual theme that's in this text, and it is eating. Eating. How many of you like that? I could talk about tithing or eating right now. Which one do you want me to hit? All right, we'll talk about eating for a second. I'm not talking about tithing at all today. I just thought that was funny. Over and over in Luke, Jesus is either headed to a meal or he's leaving a meal. This is just something we really appreciate about Jesus. Ten times in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is sitting at a meal, and the meal is relevant to the discussion at hand. Seven times, Jesus is not at a meal, but he's talking about food. How many of you know somebody that way? They're either eating or talking or planning the next meal, right? Then that's Jesus. That's the way that Jesus was. He was always eating or thinking about the next meal that he was going to eat. Eating has this huge theme within Scripture. If you think about it for just a second, the Bible starts with something you should not eat. It carries on through all sorts of meals and relationships. At one point, Jesus instills a a meal that every time we take it, we will remember the sacrifice that Jesus gave us. And then the Bible ends with the marriage supper of the Lamb. We joke about it all the time. Well, Baptist, you know, we're going to get together and we're going to eat, that sort of thing. But that's good. It's a funny joke. You should keep joking about it. But at the other side, you should see how powerful eating together really means. You want to grow closer as a small group? Then share meals together. You want to share the gospel with somebody who doesn't yet know Jesus? Then share a meal with them. If you want your church to be filled with diversity, then your dinner table needs to be diverse. There is power in sharing a meal together. And this happens all the way through the Bible. In fact, the very next story, if you read it later, skim through it. It's one of my favorite lines when Jesus says, do y'all have anything to eat? It's just just the way he is. He likes to eat. And so if you're that way, you are very much like Jesus. So there is these three themes, walking, seeing, eating, eating. I was struck uh, as we went through the Luke series, especially at that point in which Jesus, uh, he meets Zacchaeus. Y'all remember that? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. He climbed up the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. In that story, I was really, it just, it's, it's stuck with me ever since I preached it several weeks ago, that really what caused the fight, really what opens up the text Really where we begin to understand what Jesus is doing is because Jesus invited himself to eat with Zacchaeus. And look, these themes really speak to all of us. Some people think that they have to be perfect, that they have to have it all figured out before they can begin a relationship with Jesus, but that's just not what the, teach, that's just not what the Bible teaches. Zacchaeus was not perfect These people were clearly not perfect. You are invited to walk along with Jesus, to share fellowship with Jesus, to see him as he really is. And you don't have to come to him understanding all of that. Why? Because he'll walk you through it later. You just start walking with Jesus. That's the invitation today. If you have not yet began a walk with Jesus, then today's the day that you begin a walk with Jesus. A couple of main points from the text. The first one is simply this. Jesus is resurrected. Jesus is alive. When you read this story, why did Luke include this story in his gospel narrative? He's the only one to write this story in here. So why did he put this story in here? He put this story in here as evidence that Jesus is alive. In fact, some of the things that you read in the story, they just seem so happenstance, like a dude named Cleopas, who lived seven miles from Jerusalem in a town named Emmaus. Here's the cool thing about that. When Luke published his work, when it was getting all circulated and everybody was reading it and passing it on and reading it out loud to groups, any one of them could have just gone to Emmaus, found Cleopas, and asked him, is that, did it happen? Did it happen like that? See, Luke puts the names in there as verifiable proof of what happens. Acts chapter 2 tells us that Jesus not only resurrected from the dead, but that he ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is alive. 
and he reigns. So let me tell you this, friend, Christian, follower of Jesus, person who walks with Jesus through your life, you have no reason to be afraid. There is nothing you need to fear. Jesus is alive. He beat death and he now reigns. And so a lot of times people seem so dominated by fear. They make their decisions afraid of what might happen. But you should not live in fear. You should live in the reality that Jesus is alive, that he beat death and he now reigns. It's not only that we shouldn't live in fear, but we should live in hope. Hope is not wishing that something would come to pass. Hope is knowing it's going to because I'm trusting the one who beat death. That's what hope is. So I don't live in fear, but I do hope in the future because things are going to get better. I'm just not really afraid of movements or theories or thoughts or this group thinking those thoughts. I'm not afraid of those things. You know why? Because Jesus is alive. He beat death. He can beat anything else. And the other thing is to walk it out, to keep walking. When these two um, tag up with Jesus and they're walking along, they knew, they knew some good things, right? They knew he was a prophet, a prophet before God. They knew that he was mighty in word and in deed. They knew a lot of the text already. In fact, I believe that Cleopas and his wife or his friend, that they fully knew a lot of the Old Testament. It's just that they didn't fully understand it. They had a lot of those pieces, but then they needed to walk it out with Jesus. And that's a reminder to us that this Christian life is not a one-time decision and then you're done. It's not a walk down an aisle and fill out a card and get um, baptized and then you're done. It is a lifelong walk with God. And so you understand things and you pick up things and you begin to understand and see things, but you're going to walk them out too many Christians believe that Christianity is about making a stand on what they think they know and not a walk with the person that they can get to know. That's what Christianity is about, is walking with Jesus, not giving all of the answers and believing that you have learned all there is to learn. You can walk with Jesus for the full seven miles and at the end, you will just begin to see him. And when you begin to see him, you will not fully be able to grasp him because he disappeared. Begin a walk with Jesus and keep on walking with Jesus. So there you have it. Just a ordinary story of just two people walking home after an eventful weekend. But I pray that as we leave here today, that we would be encouraged to see Jesus in the everyday, in the walk home, in the running the errands, in the driving through downtown, that no matter what comes at you, whether it's unexpected like a horse's neigh or exciting like a child's laughter, that you will see Jesus in those moments and you will see him because you know what the scripture teaches. And that's how we will walk with God. Let's pray. God, Thank you for what you have given us, even though, Lord, we do not deserve it. I pray today that every person who's in this room and watching online, that they would be challenged by your scriptures, that they would, they would realize that they have not yet arrived. That there's still a long walk ahead of them. And that they would daily mature, knowing you more and more in the simple things like seeing and walking and eating, but in the amazingly spiritual disciplines, like seeing you as scripture teaches, walking with you through our lives and sharing a meal with those who need to know you. In all of this, we give you the glory, the praise and the honor. Amen. We're going to uh, provide for you an opportunity if you would stand with us. Rich is gonna, Rich is gonna sing a song. And it just gives you a moment to respond. Whatever it is that the word of God has laid on your heart, whatever it is that scripture has taught you, maybe you respond now. Over here to my left, there's a room, a decision room where there are, where there are volunteers that would love to pray with you and encourage you. Whatever it is that God has laid on your heart, you respond now as Rich Place. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for church you can have a seat as you are let me uh let me share something with you the church um sunday mornings it takes an army to do what we do here and and um, i'm encouraged every week by those who are volunteering in our church and i and i talk to people all the time who yeah yeah i know i need to get involved or i want to get involved and that's truly where i believe people are i want to get involved but i'm not sure i have the time or the knowledge uh to kind of plug into the church and so I just wanted to share with you that there's a bunch of ways that you can get involved that won't pull you out of service, uh, that are on rotations, like every six uh, weeks you kind of pitch in and you help out, and um, various ages. And so like you can be 12 or, or 72 and help out in a, in, a, in a ton of different ways. Coffee is one of those, uh, you know, uh, helping out, sharing the coffee. The TV. You know, it comes out here and it goes back away. That's not magic. Somebody did that, you know. And so that's a way in our children's ministry, there's a ton of, of you know, zero entry opportunities where you can just, you just kind of say, hey, put me in and we'll put you in and, and you serve. And I, I'm telling you, it's so fulfilling. It's so good to be a part of a team that does something at such an amazing level. And so I want to encourage you to do that. You can email info at mysecond.family and find out other ways that you can be involved. You can also watch this video and find out other ways that you can be involved. I love you, church. I'll see you next week. Here is what's going on at our church. We are excited to announce the return of the monthly Senior Adult Potluck Lunch. If you're age 55 and older, you won't want to miss the gathering on June 9th at noon. It's always a great time of fellowship and fun. Bring your favorite dish to share and join us. We are happy to let you know that traditional service is returning Sunday nights on June 13th. Everyone is welcome to attend this one hour service and join in singing from the Baptist hymnal and hearing a sermon from minister Daryl Ray. This service is held in the annex and is open to all ages. VBS is live and in person as we go on Destination Dig. Starting June 21st, we will unearth the truth about Jesus. This year, VBS is for children entering kindergarten through fifth grade. Space is limited, so register today at mysecond.family. This August, we will open a new year-long internship to people interested in various roles in our church. As an intern at Second Baptist, you'll receive hands-on training while serving alongside experienced pastors and ministry leaders. You'll gain experience that will help you develop the leadership skills needed for the next stage of your ministry, as well as getting the behind the scenes look at how Second Baptist operates. Go to the missions page at mysecond.family for all the details. Do you play an instrument or know a talented Second Family member that does? We're looking for instrumentalists to join the worship band and lead our Second Family on Sunday mornings. Contact Bailey Byers for more information. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Hey, we'll see you next week.